So as we said before the break, this afternoon's sessions are going to focus on the really important topic of climate and climate change and how that's affecting displaced communities. And I'm really delighted to hand over responsibilities for this session to Nick Bishop and his esteemed panel. So Nick, over to you. Thank you so much, Charlie. Um, afternoon, colleagues. I hope you enjoyed your lunch. Uh, I'd like to say first and foremost, thank you very much to Juan and Dare for the invitation to be with you this week in Nairobi. Um, my name is Nick Bishop. I'm IOM's Disaster Risk Reduction Program Lead um, in our headquarters in Geneva. Um, as I said, it's, a, it's an absolute pleasure to be here with you uh, for our session on climate and environment. Um, basically, what we're going to discuss today is the increasing criticality of climate change, DRR, in camp coordination and camp management. So we're looking at shifting the narrative from the periphery to the center. Um, as you can all imagine, in the past, climate change has not necessarily been center stage, uh, especially in crisis response. Now, given everything that's happening around us, it's very much moved to the center of the agenda, and I think for, for very obvious reasons. The escalating threats of climate change, environmental degradation, and disasters really demand from all of us that climate action, adaptation, and risk reduction become a central pillar of our collective response. Here in East Africa, we are all witnessing the devastating consequences of climate change. That is certainly true of Kenya, where heavy rains and flash floods have affected an estimated 1.6 million people across the wider region. As of last week, nearly 500 people have lost their lives, and over 400,000 persons are now living in displacement. Globally, we know that nearly 120 million people are now living in displacement with millions more at risk. This global humanitarian crisis demands an immediate and comprehensive response. Just last year, natural hazards forced more than 26 million people from their homes. We must heed the data in front of us. 2023 saw more than 400 disasters globally linked to natural hazards, resulting in 86,000 deaths and costing more than $93 million. Excuse me, impacting 93 million lives. The IPCC, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, tells us that extreme weather events are becoming much more frequent, more intense, and longer lasting. At the same time, urban migration is on the rise. Informal settlements where so many people end up living in displacement lack basic infrastructure, access to services, and are highly vulnerable to extreme events. Our first priority remains saving lives. This is where all of you as CCCM stakeholders play such a vital role. Yet we know we cannot stop here. The climate crisis with its devastating social and economic impacts demands that we shift from reactive responses to proactive climate-informed strategies integrated within our humanitarian operations. True resilience means building adaptive pathways for displaced communities, enabling them not only to survive, but thrive in the face of climate impacts. The CCCM sector can become a catalyst for the type of changes the broader humanitarian system needs to adapt to the changing climate. Climate smart and climate-informed approaches related to site selection, site planning and improvement that considers flooding, fire, and heat risks, building materials that mitigate heat and promote well-being, sanitation and water provision that is safe and culturally appropriate. In line with the first ever activation of Bangladesh's heat action protocol in late April and a growing number of storm, disease, flooding, and other hazard-related anticipatory action programs, early warning and early action represent intervention areas which require urgent scale-up to become effective tools in saving lives and building resilience. We know that no single entity can address these challenges alone. Operational actors, such as yourselves, are increasingly collaborating with climate experts, urban planners, and crucially, displaced communities themselves. Without a concerted focus on preparedness and adaptation oriented towards solutions, Displacement crisis due to climate change will continue to escalate. Today, I am honored to introduce our distinguished panelists. 
To my left, um, Sophie Throstrup is an independent consultant specializing in humanitarian and climate policy. She is an experienced humanitarian who has worked to strengthen emergency responses with the Tony Blair Institute for Global Change, the Cash Learning Partnership Network, OCHA, and the United Kingdom's Foreign Commonwealth and Development Office. To Sophie's left, I'm, I'm very pleased to welcome Jia Kong An, who works within the Urban Practices Branch at the United Nations Human Settlements Program, UN Habitat, here in Nairobi. Jia Kong's expertise in sustainable urban development and community resilience makes her a valuable addition to our discussions today. And lastly, but certainly not least, Jason Mattis is a development professional with over 30 years of humanitarian peace building and post-conflict recovery experience with USAID, the EU, the United Nations, and the World Bank. He has worked extensively in, South, in Sudan and South Sudan in support of peace initiatives. Currently, Jason works with DT Global as the Senior Conflict and Peace Building Advisor for Transition and Conflict Mitigating Programming. Please give our panelists a warm welcome. Uh, without further ado, over to you, Sophie. Thanks so much. So the first thing to say is I'm really delighted to be here talking to the CCCM cluster today. I don't say this to every cluster I speak to, but for me, the CCCM cluster have always been the cool kids of humanitarian response and the get stuff done cluster. Often you go to a sudden onset emergency, everyone else is talking about what they should be doing, pouring over maps, and you guys have generally gone out and already built a camp for hundreds of thousands of people. So it is great to be talking to the people that are getting stuff done. And that's really what I wanted to talk about today. So I've spent the last two years in particular kind of really steeped in the global policy discussions around where humanitarian and climate meet. And unfortunately, we've got to a situation where while policy has moved miles ahead in the last couple of years, operations haven't yet caught up. And I think that's what I wanted to talk to everyone in this room about today is about your critical role in closing that gap. So the one sentence version of what I want to say to you, so for those of you that have emails to catch up on who are feeling a bit jet lagged, you can switch off after this, is there are two key things that I think the CCCM cluster can do in this space. And the first is to close that gap between policy and practice. And the second is to help flip the script from a conversation around what the humanitarian system can do about climate, given its tools, skills and positions currently, to what people on the front lines of the climate crisis actually need, what the problem is, and building backwards to what, therefore, we collectively, looking beyond this room, beyond the humanitarian bubble, can do about it. It's really, really great to see this as the first item on the agenda for all of you. And I understand the agenda was crowdsourced, so it says to me that it's top of everyone's mind, which is really great to hear. Um, it's not at all surprising because, obviously, as Nick has already said, even just thinking about this region in the last couple of years alone, you have all been dealing with the impacts of five failed rainy seasons, an impact, a, a situation made a hundred times more likely by the climate crisis, and then by devastating floods that have devastated um, this region, including this very city. And you might see traces of that as you travel around the city um, over the next few days. If we look a little bit forward, we know that by mid-century, we are talking about most displacement sites that we currently work in, dealing with 100 plus days a year over 35 degrees centigrade, so that we know camp infrastructure, shelter infrastructure as currently construed without big fundamental infrastructure changes become dangerous heat traps at that level. So what does that mean for the ways that we work? We also, and you will hear from my esteemed panelist on my left about this in much more detail, we're also sitting in a continent where the urban population is set to double by mid-century, and that includes the city that we're sitting in today. So Nairobi is projected to increase from around 5 million people to around 10 million by mid-century. It's hard to imagine that, but it's a huge, huge challenge for the ways that we work. So everything that we do, all our operational toolkits are really, really challenged by what's going on, and you see that in your work every single day. So it's a bit surprising, therefore, that it's taken the global humanitarian system this long to catch up with climate change as a really critical issue. But finally, it has, and we've seen this real flurry of activity over the last couple of years. We've seen the Climate and Environment Charter being launched, which now has its own secretariat. The IASC are working on a climate roadmap. Um, COP28 this year, last year, for the first time, had humanitarian issues really at the center. There was the first dedicated Relief, Recovery and Peace Day. It launched a number of really exciting initiatives. 
And again, looking just to this city, the UN Climate Crisis Coordinator for the El Nino and La Nina responses, Rina Galani, who's um, who's situated here, was appointed. All of these initiatives say climate is now too important for us to ignore. The impacts of climate crises on the most vulnerable populations are growing out of control, and we need to do something. And that's really positive development. All of these developments are really positive. But what I will say is there are two important gaps where all of you in the room can play a role. The first important gap is that policy has moved faster than practice. We know we need to do something. We don't yet know what that something is. Many of you in the room will be experiencing day to day what that something might look like. We need to close that gap. And number two, the policy dialogue around this is very much about what can my agency, what can my humanitarian system offer in this situation rather than what is needed and working outwards. So I wanna talk about the first issue in this chunk and hopefully we'll get to flipping the script later. As I mentioned, the humanitarian system has now woken up to the fact that we need radical change. We need to work radically differently, but it's kind of stopped there. We haven't quite filtered down into getting, um, changing the ways we operationalize our work, changing the global knowledge base and saying, operating in the climate crisis means that we do think and plan fundamentally differently and here's how. In this room, there is huge lived experience. You have all, I imagine, dealt with displacement crises in drought, in floods, with um, severe weather events changing course and acting in ways that we didn't expect. You know what the problem looks like and what we need to do about it. But we haven't connected the dots. We haven't connected across organizations, across clusters, um, across individuals, even across contexts, that knowledge to build and drive a radically new way of doing humanitarian assistance. And that's where I think the cluster system is so well placed to step in. I wanna give three quick examples. Um, the first is we know obviously that if we intervene without attempting to build the resilience of vulnerable communities to the next crisis, in a situation where the baseline is getting worse day by day, we're actually leaving people worse off. So we need to be investing in building resilience. But all the data we have, says that humanitarian attempts to build community resilience actually haven't worked. We've got very, very few examples of where we have effectively built climate resilience or general resilience over time. So what knowledge is there in this room that can help change that? How can we learn from each other and make sure that when we're attempting to build resilience, we're doing it right? The second is on early warning and anticipatory action, which I'm sure you'll talk about a lot over the course of the day. Um, it's super important. We need to do more to see disasters coming and respond ahead of time. That much is clear. But it's really, really hard to do that well in some of the complex settings in which you operate and with some of the complex intersecting crises that we've seen over the last few years. So again, what knowledge is there in this room to feed back into that global machine to say, here's how we anticipate crises well in really fragile contexts and where crises don't behave as we expect. And then the last one, is we know obviously that in this changed world, humanitarian action, humanitarian planning isn't good enough if we're not considering climate risk. But what I'd ask you in the room is what kind of climate risk are we thinking about? Are we just looking to the next cyclone, the next flood, the next drought, and thinking about how we ready ourselves for that crisis? Or are we thinking actually in some of the places that we work 20 years from now, it won't be viable to make a living from subsistence farming. It might not be viable to live there at all. What are we thinking in terms of some of the urbanization trends that we'll talk about later? How can we work with those and support people to be fit for a more complex future rather than just fit for the next cyclone? So I know that my other panelists have lots to say on this and I've already taken up lots of time, but looking forward to hearing from them and from you later on some of these critical challenges. Over to you. Thank you so much, Sophie, for your thought-provoking remarks. Um, over to Giacom. Can I ask you, um, given rapid urbanization, rural urban migration patterns driven by disasters, environmental and climate changes, conflict and their impacts on living conditions in many country contexts, from the perspective of UN Habitat, what are some of the most significant infrastructural and social, social challenges posed by the rapid growth of informal settlements, and how does your organization work with national and municipal office officials to consider displacement to and within settlements? Thank you very much, Nick. And thank you so much to IOM and colleagues for having you and Habitat on this panel today as well. 
Um, I hope everyone has energy after lunch also. Um, so, so yes, thank you very much. Um, you know, the first thing that as you and Habitat and as urban practitioners and custodians of sustainable cities and communities, the first thing that comes into mind when we think about informal settlements, um, and I'm sure it's very relevant to the work of the CCCM, the first is act to actually talk about location. Um, most informal settlements, as we know, are situated in hazard-prone areas, in areas which, which, which are not well-developed. You know, these are floodplains, coastal zones. Um, you know, we're talking about such a high exposure to floods, landslides, cyclones and hurricanes. Um, simply considering the location as one of the first um, key areas of focus can already bring to question, you know, is this, you know, is this a viable place to live? And as we sort of then scale down, let's scale it down to the human level. Um, when we look at the info, at an informal settlement and where displaced populations are being hosted and, and live in as well, what is the first thing that actually comes to mind? And the first thing that comes to mind is shelter and housing at the very granular scale. We're talking about housing that, you know, conditions where people are living in overcrowded areas, places which are poorly sanitized, places which are unsafe to live in, you know, as we actually broaden that scale and actually look wider at the settlement, we realize as well that basic services, the needs are unmet. You know, access to water, access to electricity, access to power, um, and so many of these, um, so many of these situations keep displaced populations and people who live in informal settlements in this in this um, vicious cycle where when a disaster hits, for example, what are some of the health emergencies that will emerge immediately, you know, in a, in a situation like this? You know, where is the nearest hospital? Where are the certain health centers? You know, people, people are struggling to live in a place that is safe. What about addressing their needs um, when it comes to disasters? Another core issue as well, um, when we think about informal settlements, especially in urban areas, is that informal people who live in informal settlements do not have secure land tenure um, um, rights. You know, we're talking about people who have been displaced, but now they're residing in a place where they could equally be displaced once again, forcibly evicted. Um, if that so comes. And I know that there is so much work that is being pushed on HLP uh, within this cluster as well. And we've got colleagues in the room who can definitely contribute to, the, to that discussion further as well. Um, and I'd like to talk just a little bit about the social challenges as well, which was part of that question too. What are the social challenges when we think about living when in informal settlements, you know? Is there a stigma that is carried for populations who live in informal settlements? You know, is there is there discrimination, marginalization, you know, acknowledging certain kind of vulnerabilities that come from social stigma towards a population group as well is also worth identifying. And how does that then tie in to when you consider the economic opportunities that are made available to these people? You know, let's say we're talking about people who live uh, you know, in, in an area with poor connectivity? How do they get, how do they get to work? And many of the pro programs and the projects as well that are being implemented talk about actually you know, building economic resilience. But you know, one of the questions that we have to ask ourselves is how do we do that when people are not able to live with a daily wage? How, how you know, when the program ends, what's next? For these people. So these are some of the infrastructural and social challenges um, that really come into mind when, when we talk about informal settlements or even underserved uh, neighborhoods in urban areas. Um, and, and, you know, what UN Habitat has been doing as custodians um, for Sustainable Goal Development Goal 11 um, has been really putting the collaboration with local governments and with local authorities and with local stakeholders at the center of this response. Um, of course, you know, it's difficult in, in, a, in an emergency situation. Where is the time? Where are the resources? But at the same time, you know, a, maybe a separate trajectory can also occur where a comprehensive overview is sort of is sort of presented, is sort of gathered. You have considerations on physical, socioeconomic, political situations on the site. You can come up with evidence-based responses and solutions that reflect not what 
maybe humanitarian partners are hoping, but what is actually the need of the beneficiaries in align with existing, um, for example, planning regulations and planning frameworks and such. Um, so I think it's it's definitely a worthwhile conversation to be had, especially after Sophie has shared as well, um, what is the gap between policy and practice and operations? How do we close that gap? Who should we be talking to? You know, are we going to be talking to the Ministry of Development, the Ministry of, of Planning, you know, which is determining the, the spatial strategy for this area, who will be determining the development trajectory of this area? You know, are we saying as humanitarian practitioners that, look, this area is perhaps not the safest, you know, that this area has certain gaps that need to be met? How do we actually ensure that this is fed into a development strategy at an urban level that we can ensure the sustainable kind of uh, implementation of it as well in alignment to the to the broader um, regulations frameworks as well. Thanks. Thank you so much uh, for your insightful remarks. Um, I'd like to turn it over now to to Jason. Um, Jason, from your perspective, could you take us through the likely impacts of some of the growing natural resource competition that we're seeing? and the increasingly evident links between climate change, conflict, and fragility. Given your experience working on these issues, how should these realities influence proposed system changes, including to the work of operational actors like the CCM cluster? So first, thank, um, sorry, first thanks uh, for inviting me to this meeting. Um, it's a new cluster. I'm not, I wasn't familiar. I'm familiar with much of the work you do, but to me, it's exciting to engage with you all. Um, also, thanks our Kenyan hosts, the guys, the people that stood up earlier, and I also want to just thank my uh, Sudanese colleagues who helped set me, prepare me for this presentation, more importantly, remain on the front line of one of the, uh, the world's worst uh, displacement crises as we speak. Um, I'm going to ask a question, tell a story, unpack it quickly, and then ask the question again. Yeah. So the question is, we've been here a long time. I've worked on Sudan for over 30 years, and I was also late to the humanitarian response. Um, do you think largely the way we operate, the way we work are part of the status quo, or do you think we're part of a movement for change? So let me now just tell a story to get back to that question. Um, I spent most of my um, professional career working on the Nuba Mountains. So the Nuba Mountains sit in central Sudan. They're about the size of Nepal or Bangladesh, Tajikistan, I understand. Um, and they're in the transition between the arid north and the floodplains of South Sudan. Um, in the late 60s, the government instituted a policy under the slogan, land will go to those who use it. And then they took the land of the Nuba people and started to develop it into large scale agriculture. They then, in 71, put in unre uh, implemented the Unregistered Land Act, which basically confiscated and all, put all customary land under the, under the state. And then they made it illegal to take a case to court to say that that was your land. And when the Nuba still resisted this, they then armed up the herding community to move them by force off of their land and into the marginal areas. This community was already under pressure from droughts to the north and expanding, and expanding desertification, or already blocked by the large scale mechanized sector. So they put these two communities directly in competition with each other on the marginal lands in the Nuba Mountains, in this horseshoe of hills. The Nuba moved towards the SPLA, many of them joining them in the larger struggle against uh, the government in Khartoum. And some of the herders joined the Popular Defense Force uh, and became a militia of their government during that long war. But the conflict in the Nuba Mountains was described by several as a, as a genocide. Um, but essentially, the process was a scorched earth policy where the government occupied the productive plains with garrisons, drove the people up into the side, into the mountains on marginal territory, blocked trade and aid into the SBLM controlled areas, and then put camps on the side of the government to attract people over. And again, those camps, um, a lot of atrocities were committed in those camps as well. Um, that was the brutal war campaign that happened. Uh, in 2005, there was an agreement that paused the violence um, in 2011, when the South decided to secede and become its own country, Nuba Mountains was left in the north, along with Abyei and Blue Nile, and war quickly kicked off after the vote in Nuba, Blue Nile, and Abyei. That war continues. In 2019, 
a large scale popular movement rose up, largely led by youth and women to overthrow the Bashir regime starting in the periphery, driving him out. They pressured for change. There was an agreement. They pressured again for change. They had a coup. They pressured again, and then they went to war. So the rapid support force, which is legacy, is built on the kind of the PDF militia and the army fighting each other. Right now, we have about 700,000 people who fled into the Nuba Mountains. So that's about 100,000 new homes built out of natural material. That's about a 100,000 new farms are going to be cleared. That's a lot of burnt bricks. That's a lot of charcoaling that's about to happen. Um, but right now, that same group that moved everybody, that helped remove Bashir, is on the front line, receiving IDPs, finding places for them to sit, to stay, putting, you know, organizing protection sites it's, that's there. They're doing humanitarian assistance. They're negotiating ceasefires. They're opening corridors for peace, um, corridors for aid. Um, they're leading it while the international community is struggling to get back in and get the kind of access that the Sudanese have. So I come back and say if you, to this question, which is, if you listen to the story, did you hear about a cycle, a cycle of deprivation, conflict, famine, displacement, some kind of agreement? Again, deprivation, conflict, marginalization, famine, displacement. These patterns keep going around and around. If you heard that, then you've basically adding in the uncertainty of climate change and the potential for um, it to make the ability to find a viable livelihood harder, it's catastrophic. I don't, it's very hard to figure out how it will change because both the causes and the consequences of this violence come from the uh, people's ability to access their rights in and access to natural resources. But if you heard a different story, if you heard the story of a, of a regime or a way of a system of governance collapsing, being removed, falling apart, consuming itself, and at the same time, the rise of a popular nonviolent struggle, collective struggle, then you have hope. If you've listened to this, if you heard the story and thought about young people, women leading change and effectively delivering that change, then we're talking about people who can adapt because one day it's diploma, one day it's removing Bashir, the next day it's put pressuring for political change, the next day it's keeping people alive, negotiating a ceasefire, right? Um, and I think the challenge for all of us is how do we support them on the front line? Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much, Jason. Um, I'd like to come back to Sophie now. Um, you, you, you gave us, uh, I think, a really strong starting point by talking about investing in resilience, um, that there's a lot of potential around the knowledge in the room and how we can come together and share uh, and learn from one another. Um, with that in mind, I mean, to your mind, what kind of concrete steps can practitioners take to advocate for and implement meaningful adaptations that ensure a higher quality of life for displaced populations facing intensifies, intensifying hazards? Yeah, great question. Thanks, Nick. So, so here I would come back to three things that I think are really, really important for all of us in the room to do, for all of you in the room to do, and for the CCCM cluster to do overall, to change the discourse from one, and I think you've, you've, you very gently and rightly called me out on the fact that lots of what we've talked about so far is kind of 30,000 foot policy level stuff. To bring that down into the concrete realities, lived realities of the, what the people we serve, the people on the front lines of the cri climate crisis need every day. So what can we do to flip the script, to change from a conversation about what can our organizations as currently set up do with our limited toolbox in these places with a changing crisis, a changing um nature of crisis that we're seeing to what's needed what are people on the front lines of the crisis of the climate crisis actually experiencing living every day what do they need even if it can't come from me from my organization from our system what is it that's needed so there's three key things here the first thing i would say is we need to listen better we need to advocate more so time and time again when we talk to communities affected by climate crisis and other overlapping crises we hear that they are not receiving what they need. And they're largely not receiving what they need because it's just us in this room that are in the most fragile places. Those long-term development and adapt adaptation actors simply aren't in the most fragile places. So Ground Truth Solutions did a great study in Bangladesh. There was also a recent loss and damage study in Northern Kenya. 
um, and they both said the same thing. People said, we need long-term infrastructure investment. We need reskilling. We need help moving out of subsistence farming into um, the types of livelihoods that will set us up for maybe a move to an urban center. And sometimes we need help relocating. But what we're getting is seeds, tools, and food. And while that's helpful for getting us through the next couple of weeks, it's absolutely not what we need to improve our lives and the lives of our children. So all of your organizations in the room and all of you are in the in the most fragile places, in the places where people are experiencing these overlapping crises. So my first request would be, let's use that combined reach and that combined expertise to really listen to what it is people need and then bring that message up to a global stage. So even if it's not humanitarian organizations role to provide this stuff, we need to be reaching out to the people that can and we need to be bringing them to where we are and making sure that they're meeting needs as they're experienced and as they will be experienced, not as we have imagined them to be. The second one, and I'm sure you will talk a lot about this over the coming days, is the need to get more serious about handing over power. So obviously we know that climate impacts are hyper-local. The way that a drought or a flood or an extreme weather event affects one community will be really different from how it affects a community even a few miles down the road because of a number of different factors and because of the coping strategies that that community already has in place. Because of that, we've been saying this for years, but we need to get really serious about localization. And that's twofold. That's handing over power, financing and room for maneuver to local civil society organizations and local actors who know the communities, who know what they're doing there. And it's also looking for those locally led um, solutions that are already in place. So what are people already doing to adapt? Can we support that, fund that and scale that? When we look at the global data, despite years of banging the drum about this, we're actually going backwards. We're doing worse on localization than we were a couple of years ago. So what can all of our organizations and all of us do in the, in the room to get really serious about handing over power and getting more local in our response? And the third one is building partnerships. So I've touched on this already, and we're, I'm lucky enough to be sharing a, a stage with UN Habitat, who are a very important partner for this. Um, but lots of what's needed goes far outside what we as the humanitarian system can do. We know that we can't build long-term climate resilience without partnering with long-term development actors, governments, um, and climate adaptation actors. But as we've already said, the problem is they're often not in the places where they're most needed. They're often not in the places where we work. And so out of frustration, we default to trying to do it ourselves. I would say use that reach that we all have from um, the communities in which we work to our global headquarters, all of whom have advocacy capacity to say, here's what, what's needed. Here's the people that we need. Here are the types of support that we need in this place. Let's do it. I think it's striking that this week, this very week, in another lovely hotel just down the road, the African Development Bank are having their global meetings. And I am sure that their discussions are not being informed by what all of you in this room know. Um, so what more can we do to make sure that organizations like the African Development Bank, like the World Bank, some of these long-term climate adaptation and finance actors are hearing what the situation is like on the very front lines of this crisis, understanding what are needed, and are being helped to move into some of those more fragile places where they're currently not. So those are three hopefully slightly more concrete suggestions. I'll hand back to you, Nick. Thank you so much, Sophie. Um, to something we discussed over lunch, I think those are immensely quotable. Uh, listen better, advocate more, use combined reach, combined expertise, support, fund, scale. Uh, I think those all resonate strongly with, with the audience, I hope. Um, I'd like to go back to, to Jia Kong. Um, I'm wondering how we can better plan for and integrate informal settlements um, or even underserved neighborhoods in, in some of the, the cities where, where Habitat is, is working uh, to improve living conditions and resilience for displaced populations. Um, could you share maybe with us some examples from, from your recent work? Thank you. Thank you very much, Nick. Um, yes. I think from from UN Habitat's perspective, you know, and and also hearing um, hearing and also listening in to last year's uh, last year's CCCM annual meeting uh, recordings as well, um, I've actually come to realize that there is so much potential that can be bridged um, with a deeper understanding of the urban environment and of the city. 
for, for humanitarian practitioners. The same way that humanitarian practitioners want to work and want to ensure that the solutions that they put in place continue to be relevant and sustainable for the long term, the same applies. Development actors also would like to work with humanitarian actors to make cities safe and sustainable for everyone who lives in them as well. And at UN Habitat, one of the, the ways that sort of the thinking that we have is, is a three-pronged approach. We look at the urban area as a complex system. We see that the decisions that are made in it, you know, urban planning and design, that's one. You know, the second is the policy, the, regu the regulations and the legislations that are put in place. That is a plan, a spatial plan. That is a development strategy. That is an upgrading strategy of an informal settlement, for instance. Those kind of actual act actualities that we have to acknowledge as part of our programming and our projects, because they will determine what actually, what actually results of the projects that are being put in place. And lastly, the connection to sustainable financing solutions. Municipal financing solutions, working with non-traditional actors, for instance, the private sector with their technologies and their innovations, as well as acknowledging the opportunity to, to link the understanding of financing to local economic development. So that's, that's one of the, the insights that I can share from you in Habitat and the way that we work, and which could perhaps be interesting as well to humanitarian actors. Um, I would like to share an example of a project um, that we have in, in Douala, Cameroon. Um, so this project is, um, it's an, we use UN Habitat's integrated spatial prof profiling and spatial planning methodology um, to actually understand first, you know, to gather information spatially, socioeconomically, um, politically, a comprehensive overview of the existing situation. Um, you know, the needs of the neighborhood were shared. You know, this is a neighborhood that lives uh, in a coastal region, just one to three meters above sea level, and they face flooding issues regularly. And this is these are the IDPs that had moved into Douala as well. So we worked with them. We worked with them to collect information, but most importantly, it was to visualize and to actually vis envision what a future actually looks like for them together with the local authorities. And this meant that we actually, you know, you and Habitat, we actually sat back. I could say that we mediated the process, but the vision statement that came up, the priorities that came up, that was actually decided by the community who lived there as well as the local authorities. The way that we worked with this and, and why we wanted to use this methodology was, was and it brings me back to the, to the methodology earlier, which was that with the local authorities, uh, uh, being present and participating, they were able to say, okay, you know, this community, we're going to make sure that they're taken care of. We're going to ensure that this is put into the development strategy, the development framework from this to this year. We're going to ensure that there is a budget that can actually, you know, be, be used for this programming as well. There's, a, there's an element of sustainability there that ensures the long-term response. And the prioritization response that we that we undertook, what how that is important as well is that it continues the the flow, the conversation from persons who are displaced to all the actors in the room. You bridge the platform to allow them to be able to interact in a space safely with authorities as well. So so that is one of the project examples that I wanted to share. Um, um, Oops, no, and, and I have one, one additional point, which is linking to the financing uh, strategy as well. What this project and what we envisioned to do with this project was to identify the prioritized infrastructures that needed to be that needed to be integrated into this area. And we ensured to create through us and through our partners the link to potential financiers. So this you see then the private sector come in. Sometimes the private sector, you know, banks, they've got specific, uh, specific requests, they've got specific um, um, uh, checklists that they have to meet. And sometimes it, it meets, it meets, you know, sometimes it meets. And when that does, you can propose for something that is also a wonderful collaboration coming in from what is seen often as a non-traditional partner. Um, okay, time. Thank you very much. Happy to speak further. Later. Thank you so much. Um, I think a lot of interesting food for thought, particularly given Dare's presentation this morning about number one, budgetary needs for the CCM cluster, in addition to the fact that many IDPs are now living in informal settlements. Um, 
turning back to Jason, um, and then sort of reflecting on uh, our colleague Conrad this morning, who who obviously brought us to bridge over troubled water. Um, Jason, I'm I'm wondering with so much focus now given to the solutions agenda, um, both from the policy and programmatic perspective, which our our other panelists have have discussed. To your mind, how can peace and security, humanitarian DRR, and climate change practitioners work more collectively to identify solutions for displaced persons? Thank you. Uh, look, I think the, first of all, like the, the mutual aid groups, like the one like I was describing incident, they don't have a nexus problem. We have a nexus problem. We've been trying to move them into categories or boxes that allow us to provide assistance to them. I think the story highlight that I told before highlights anything. It's the complexity. The same group of people have faced four different types of conflict, communal conflict, citizen state violence, inter-borders, violence and um and kind of elites struggling to stay in power all of which are manipulating them and they face four different kinds of displacement they displacement for a policy on the greater good clearing the land for production for the rest of the country and and their marginalization from it a pol they um displaced in a policy that used displacement as part of a war strategy they were displaced for environmental degradation and they were displaced as a haven, a safe haven to get there. It's very hard to think we can navigate that kind of complexity with the way we're organized. So we come back to this question of really focusing on the who over the what. The kinds of outcomes, what kinds of skills, perspectives, relationships do communities and local groups need to navigate all of this complexity and the uncertainty and unpredictability that climate change is adding into the, into the mix. And I think all of you have answers to this. I'm not going to try to say, here's the, here's the golden list. But I think for me, three things have actually changed the way I think about how we support local groups. One, coming from a peace building perspective, the nonviolent struggle, the groups that people that focus on nonviolent action have a lot to offer us in terms of collective action, nonviolent management of change. I think that's an area to look at. The people who do trauma work, work on trauma awareness, psychosocial support, in terms of how people see themselves, see each other, how they collectively organize, um, the sense of victimization, the sense of revenge, their ability to see opportunities, to calculate risk, trauma-informed approaches, I think, are, are there. And the last is this difference between tradition and custom, especially for those of us who work in areas where there's a strong uh, uh, local customary authority. Tradition is what was, custom is what is. How do you modernize in customary systems to be able to manage this kind of change? And when I say modernize it, remember, remembering that customs evolve, now women are more important in this conversation. Youth are more important. Technology is possible in this conversation. Customary is about what people themselves, their customs and how they evolve. It cannot be imposed by us or by the state. So thinking the difference between tradition and custom, I think those three things for me have changed the way I think we operate. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jason. Um, everybody, maybe a, a warm round of applause for our panelists. Thanks very much. Uh, we'd like to spend the next sort of 15 to 20 minutes taking questions from you, either here in the room, uh, if you have any specific questions to any one of the panelists or in general, uh, or uh, to our colleagues who are listening in online. Feel free to raise your hands. We've got some mics that will circulate in the room. We'd, we'd ask you to wait until you receive the mic before asking your question, just so that the online audience can also uh, listen to you. If you could just kindly introduce yourself briefly and then proceed with your question. Any questions? Richard Nixon. Thank you so much, Nick, for guiding the discussion to the three panelists. Very, very informative that action needs to take place. Um, looks like we are concentrating the action on the community level that have always suffered the, the consequence of climate and environmental changes. I was wondering whether we want to touch the big shots, the carbon emitters, right? The huge factories. Do we have something to 
engage them. Of course, we talked about the private sectors, but um, what's the line? How do we bring them on the table? Because they cause more of the climate change and climate actions to the displaced community than the community themselves. Thank you. Thanks, Richard. Maybe we could take uh, a couple of more questions. I think Rafa has a stand up in the front as well. Jorn and Umber. Uh, yeah, because we uh, that work with the energy and environment, we often see that um, a lot of the discussions are going on uh, societal uh, uh, infrastructure support, uh, and and we are trying to then identify ourselves what is the need for us within the humanitarian sector. Uh, who is the last one to reach, uh, who are not accessing energy, who are not uh, receiving these responses. And the context you were kind of drawing with uh, displacement, uh, both uh, sub-Saharian displacement, but also then the migration and displacement towards uh, cities uh, within this region is, um, very open to the secondary cities that do not have any kind of administrative capacity or very regulated uh, growth. So we also see settlements in the parts of the cities uh, that do not have any infrastructure, neither physical or social infrastructure, and thereby uh, the coping mechanisms of the populations that settle there, all the way from HLP, you're not able to transition a temporary settlement to a home because you don't know what's happening next to the, the fact that you do not access any infrastructure and there are no administrative capacity of the governments or agencies uh, who should be of support. So yeah, that probably it's two questions. So one is then, uh, how do we identify our role as uh, an impactful actor when it comes to environment and energy in the, in the humanitarian field? And then, of course, uh, how do we better address the difficult sites and then the sites that are increasingly popping up in secondary cities in this part of the world? Thanks, Jorn. Yes, so most of the part already covered uh, by my colleague. So uh, Institute of Pakistan is the uh, ranked at eight, uh, like most vulnerable country. So you can see me now. So I'm from Pakistan. Pakistan is like the eight uh, most vulnerable country uh, in the world. Like there are so many natural disasters and these are just because of the climate change and environment. I just want to ask, a question like is there any strategy specific uh like number one is the right word, like for the region but like it is the specific strategy for pakistan like and we have to like think over the like the secure funding uh for the region like bangladesh sri lanka nepal and the pakistan even pakistan uh has like so many disasters natural disasters like cyclonic storms heat waves now this is the period in Pakistan, especially in some part of Sindh and, and some part of Punjab, there is a heat wave, the notification from the government, there is a heat wave going on. Now in well, we are in the heat wave and there is the, like the prediction for the next flood as well. And there was a like a snowfall, heavy snowfall in the winter and summer like heat wave and the floods as well. Thank you. So I just want to ask about the strategy specific for the region and for the country. And even the funding uh, to respond to any kind of emergencies like we faced in 2022 and the uh, major uh, flooding in 2020, uh, 2010 as well. Thank you. Uh, maybe, maybe we'll go with the questions that were asked just now and then we'll do a second round. Sorry about that, guys, but I appreciate your enthusiasm. 
Um, maybe I could ask Sophie if you want to jump in on on the role um, of humanitarians in terms of some of the questions that Joran was was speaking to, um, as well as the role of the private sector from Richard's question. Uh, and then maybe I can ask uh, Jia Kong if you want to speak about um, some of the the question sets about displacement to secondary cities, uh, the inability to transition from an informal settlement into a into a home. Um, and then Jason, of course, anything if you wish to add on the solution side of things, uh, maybe particularly relevant for for Pakistan. Thank you. Great questions. Thank you very much. So I'll I'll do my best, and please call me out if I haven't answered appropriately. So to start with this very live question of if most of the problems are at the infrastructure level, where do we as humanitarians fit in? And I think you. You answered the question that you were asking, really. For me, it is our role starts and ends with advocating for the most vulnerable. So in the most fragile context, in the most fragile countries, um, they're receiving less than 10% of the climate financing per capita that the most stable countries are. So the, the, the needs and the uh, flows of climate finance are completely, completely imbalanced. And I think, number one, I would say our role as humanitarians is to wave the flag and say, these are the problems we see. These are the problems that the communities we serve are experiencing. And therefore, this is what we need from you at the global level. We need the World Bank to become less risk averse and to start investing in adaptation projects in the places that we see need them the most. We need long-term development actors to move outside of the capital city, to move outside of the most stable areas, and start focusing on the places that need them most. And we need to keep waving the flag for those people who are left behind in those areas that, as we've already touched upon, may not be a viable place to live in the next 20 years. I think we have a, a real provider of last resort, as I think you mentioned, role in, in keeping that advocacy going. And then within what we can do, I think there's been a lot of quite quite vague, I would say, thinking um, done so far about what the humanitarian role is and how it needs to adapt. And that's where I think I see this group coming in to make that more concrete. But in general, the consensus is the humanitarian action that we carry out needs to be earlier. We need to be seeing disasters coming and responding to them earlier. It needs to be more flexible. So we need to adapt to a world in which Crises will be happening in areas of the world where they haven't happened before. They'll be happening at the same time. We'll see cascading crises um, where one crisis kind of spills into another, into another with global spillover effects. So we need to be more flexible in the ways that we work and plan. We need to be much more local, as already discussed. The international humanitarian system as it is now cannot be in all those places, responding to all those medium-sized disasters, cannot know what the impacts look like at the local level. So we need to get more serious about being a more local system and we need to act more in partnership. So there's a number of ways that we can change the ways we work, but I would say top of that list is we need to be waving the flag for others to come in. Um, so that was on, on how do we need to work differently? I really like the question on why are we focusing on those communities that have done the absolute least to cause the crisis from which they're suffering the worst. I think there's some really interesting thinking being done around um, kind of uh, punishment financing is not the word, but obviously it is rich countries and polluting industries that need to be paying. And so there's really interesting proposals floating around about an airline tax, um, about um, a shipping tax, for example. Um, and, and then there's the whole discussion around carbon credits. So I had a conversation with someone in the government of Kenya recently that thinks um, that, that has projected that by greening the arid north of the country, they could generate enough carbon credits to pay off Kenya's entire sovereign debt. And I think it's ideas like that that are really exciting. Um, not much concrete has come of it. We've seen rich countries really drag their feet on being held responsible for this crisis that they obviously are responsible for. But I think there's some interesting ideas in the offing around how we finance the work that we do. And those conversations should be pushed at every opportunity. And then if I can just say a quick thing on Pakistan, and um, for the last project I did, I interviewed a number of people in the government of Pakistan, and I, 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 I absolutely appreciate the enormous strain that Pakistan has been under facing concurrent heat waves, floods, a number of other disasters. So, to to try and look for a silver lining there, you said, is there a specific plan for Pakistan? Is there a specific regional plan? 
Yes, several, um, all of which I'm I'm no expert on. But what I will say is that Pakistan is helping to lead the world on that learning curve. So from the last heat wave to the most recent one, um, the big urban centers put heat action plans in place. They were much better prepared. The number of deaths fell really dramatically. And that's now what the rest of the world is learning from. So we see what heat, extreme heat is doing in Pakistan. The rest of the world is learning. We need to be pushing that learning into every single country. So it's not a very hopeful answer because Pakistan is right at the forefront, but I think there is a lot that can be done in terms of watching the experience and like Pakistan, making sure that through preparation, we keep people safe. Over. Thanks. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Um, I'll try to respond to the question about secondary cities and on the transition to a home um, on, on the HLP issues. I'm not a HLP expert, but I'll do my best to keep the focus on cities. Um, so indeed, you know, and, and I think you've pointed out such a true fact, which is that most of the migration trends we see and we know and we hear are into cities. But what we sometimes is a gap in acknowledging that actually most of the trends are into secondary cities, very often cities that don't have the allocated resources to respond adequately to these kind of migration trends. And I think what we've seen, for example, you know, we have the World Bank, we have many international organizations who have an interest as well in actually pushing for projects, for development projects, for work in these secondary cities, because we know that these secondary cities will grow and that we expect the population to more than double within these um, secondary cities because of reasons for migration, but simply also because of reasons of population growth. So this is as much a development issue as it is uh, a humanitarian issue to solve. Um, I think at the very fundamental level, you know, cities need to talk better to one another. Some cities do better than other cities. Some cities have the capacities. They have that administrative capacity, as you're saying, the leadership. Some of them have the resources, but others don't. And what we've actually seen has been that a network of cities, a network of, of uh, partners who actually can talk about these issues, can actually share their experiences of these issues at a global level, even at a regional level, um, even across the national level, can be extremely uh, can be extremely helpful. We see that you know there are there are secondary cities. I will say, for example. Um, there is a there is Koboko uh, in the West now in Uganda where you have administrative leadership and interest to actually push something for and I know that case is for for refugees but to actually support refugee integration into the community. Koboko is a much smaller city town compared to so many other areas that that we are looking and focusing on. But they have the knowledge, they have the interest. You know there are some cities and towns that are driving this further than others and quicker. And it's it will be a great point for us to actually put together this network to make sure that development actors are as present as humanitarian actors in this response, seeing that this is no longer just a humanitarian problem, but one that needs to be shared as well. Um, and with regards HLP and the transition to a home, indeed, without these adequate um, regulations put in place administratively, you know, without actually, you know, sometimes even formally rec recognizing informal settlements in urban areas, how do we actually begin the transition um, to actually create uh, adequate housing for, for, for communities? And I think that's that. And I think, you know, that echoes the words that Sophie had shared earlier, which is that we really need to use the platforms that we have to say that there is a role for humanitarian response in cities and that this response aims to support development and sustainable practices as well. I think we have to push that, you know, we have to use, uh, we, we have to come up with like a slogan or something that we can use and actually make um, to become effective when we talk about it. Because if we if we keep just talking of the continuum between the humanitarian development and the peace actors as well, we're missing it. So maybe we need to spend more time to really drill that down and to put it up somewhere as, as a community um, globally. Thanks. Jason, anything you'd like to add? Uh, maybe a very small point is the, the creation of feedback loops, the ability to take the best 
information we have on where things are changing and to bring it back to communities making decisions. If, if we ask the question to ourselves, um, what are the, you know, you would take the question of a person trying to make a decision to stay where you are, to move, to go here, to go there. How do they make the most informed decisions? How do they interpret, not just, um, how do they interpret the, the mess of information going around, the confusing nature in which we talk about ourselves, especially in, in when we talk about the aid we're providing, but also um, I saw a very interesting application that provides like a feedback loop on weather, meteorological information for urban dwellers, for fishermen, for farmers, so they can just, but it's based on their understanding and their needs to understand the weather. I think a lot of us, um, until I, if it's, for example, if they see three days of rain, then they can plant. If they see three days of dry, they can plant. Little simple things that just give them an edge because most people's livelihoods depend on the climate and the climate is no longer dependable in these rural areas. And so how do you just give them a little bit more information based on the information they need so that they're making more informed decisions? Thank you. Thanks, Jason. Um, we have one question from our online audience and then we might take one or two more in the room, but then we're gonna have to move on to the final segment of this session, uh, just conscious of the time. So the question online comes from Mustafa from the YDR Consortium in Yemen. Um, in Yemen, where local actors are supported uh, to sort of hand over tasks from the international community, how does addressing environmental issue, how can addressing environmental issues be integrated into solutions? Um, what kind of concrete strategies could also be applied or considered here? Uh, and maybe I think a couple of colleagues had their hands up earlier. Do we have one or two questions? Uh, I think Rafa, you had your hand up, please. I have one, thanks. Um, we see more and more resistance nowadays from governments in recognizing internal displacement due to climate change. Um, it's a tricky, it's a tricky thing. Um, even science, I, I don't think, at least in my region, I don't think that you can prove there is internal displacement due to climate change. Or well, at least I haven't seen evidence of that. I guess in the Pacifics and other places you have that. So the question is that, do you see this as a challenge in terms of, I mean, from a policy perspective, from uh, access to right per perspective, um, note and and you know having responsibility from governments to support these people that is displaced not only the idps but also thinking about as well as from refugees and migrants that are you know living under these double affectations Over. thanks a lot we'll take one final question and we're gonna have to to move on maybe i can ask uh muna Hello, everyone. My name is Muna Mude, and I'm from the USA. So this question is maybe could be directly for Sophie since she touched about climate policy. My question is, how can international climate policies be restructured to ensure they effectively address the specific vulnerabilities and needs of marginalized population? And what role should local communities play in shaping these policies? Oftentimes, we overlook marginalized population in this dialogue. Thank you. Thank you, Muna. Um, Jason, can we start with you? Um, on, the, on the question of climate change and, and, and whether people recognize it, again, I work with communities where 90, 95% of how they survive depends on their ability to manage the natural environment. And so places in South Sudan where that were seasonal floods, for example, are now permanent floodlands. Um, and then in Sudan, I think everybody is aware of the of the changing nature of, of the of the environment for decades with the droughts of the 70s and 80s. It's it's not a hard um it's not hard to get them to make them aware. I think the the challenge is um the unpredictability um for the communities are dealing with this and obviously the government if they're trying to respond to it because it's there's a tendency to go backwards we're kind of waiting to recover and not a tendency to adapt 
adaptation is risky. And for a lot of people who are trying to survive, it's just a lot of risk they don't have, they can't afford. Survival is about having many legs on a stool. And the more resources we put in, the more legs they build. It's not building a ladder, a ladder to prosperity. And I think a lot of our resilience thinking is about giving them opportunities to maximize. Reality is most people trying to survive are not trying to maximize. They're trying not to lose. They're trying not to lose more. And so taking on something new, going from a, a farmer or a herder to a fisher folk, going from a rural area to an urban area, these, these are immensely difficult challenges. Um, so I would say they might not want to talk about what climate, is, that the climate is changing, but I, I haven't really come across people um, saying it's not happening. I think that the issue is more and better, how do we de-risk their analysis of the future and the opportunities that are there? How do they, how do they manage and understand to the extent it's not coming back? You're not going back, it's not a bad flood year. It's now a wetlands, for example. How do we get to that point? So I think there's, I think it's within degrees. Maybe that's the answer to the question. They see it changing, but I'm not sure if they see that the full extent of where it's going to be. So maybe questions like, what is the economy of the future? And who's able to adapt towards it? And I think my example before was we've seen the amazing ability of women and youth to take on things and pivot and adapt to these changes. And I think our investments cannot be with the same old actors trying to sustain the same old way of working when you have a group of people that are kind of able to navigate some of these things. So it's probably who we're supporting in the end. Sorry, I drifted off your question, but I thought it was an interesting, um, I thought it was an interesting premise. Thank you. Do you come? Mm, I mean, if you have general responses, uh, feel free. Thank you. Um, I really like the question um, on on the issue of proof and whether there is the belief um, and understanding of whether that is really the case. And I think that continues to be something that the community does struggle with. Um, you know, and I think sometimes you can see that some some respond and and others um maybe don't respond and it's very case by case kind of scenario for it as well but i was you know i was really thinking that when when we think about cities um you know one thing one thing is that you've got disasters that happen as well in rural areas um but the moment you have disasters that happen in cities we're seeing huge scale of of um damage you know where it's it's visible on an international level you know it's it's not something that we can we can we we question you know because it's so it's so real you have buildings infrastructure completely wiped out and populations yeah so you know i think some sometimes when we when we try to have these discussions we it might help i i think to maybe try to find the angles that are more successful in communicating them as well and I think one thing that we have done has been really sort of saying, you know, with the trend, if populations are migrating into urban areas, into cities, you know, we want to put a big focus on that. And if we want to highlight through that, then any of the disasters and any of the situations that are occurring in cities to use that as the platform to push for this message as well. So it's it's um it's a difficult question because there are no um, there, it's not like math where there is a exact accurate answer solution right at the end. But I think this is something that we can keep continuing to push, trying to be as inventive and innovative in the in the messaging that we bring across as well. Thank you, um, Sophie. Maybe Muna's question about restructuring climate policy to address marginalized communities, and also the um, if anyone wants to respond on the Yemen question about the localizing localizing the response so that uh, solutions are also focusing on environmental issues and how to resolve those. Sure. Um, so, Muna, thanks. That's a, a really interesting question and, and a very topical one, because I think the good news, which is also bad news, is as the climate picture has got grimmer, we've moved from climate policies that really only thought about polluters and how we could get polluters to mitigate. So that's where all the money was going 
to then realizing, oh goodness, right, even if we cut emissions to zero tomorrow, there would still be huge parts of the population that have really serious challenges with the damage we've already done. So they've moved a little bit more into adaptation. And then, yikes, there are several areas of the world where adaptation won't work anymore. We've gone beyond adaptation and we're talking about loss and damage. So with each step in that chain, the money, the financing, the tension is getting closer to the people that are facing the worst impact. So we're moving in that direction anyway. And this COP, we saw the Declaration on Climate Peace and Security, which commits all of the big climate funders to get more serious about working in um, vulnerable and fragile places and with more marginalized communities. These big climate funders are super risk averse, even funding like a seven year project in Haiti, which is relatively uh, predictable in 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 how it's going to go is almost impossible for some of the climate finance bodies because they have to be sure that every budget line is going to be spent over seven years exactly as they've designed it and you've all worked in these contexts and you all know that even over six months that's impossible so how can we possibly do it over seven years um so we're, we're getting there the, the banks are saying the right things the climate finance people are saying the right things the focus is on the people who are starting to actively experience loss and damage from climate but we haven't yet the 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 action hasn't yet followed the word so what can we do i think donors um need to be really pushing those climate finance bodies and those climate adaptation actors to take more risks be more risk averse and focus in um in more fragile places and therefore on more marginalized communities I think as we've already talked about, humanitarians need to keep waving the flag and saying, hey, this is what we're seeing seeing on the front lines of the climate crisis. This is what people are experiencing. And if you adaptation and development guys don't get your act together, this is going to get worse and worse and worse and worse year on year. So we need to advocate. Um, and I think one tr positive trend that we are seeing is in each COP, we see more space made for indigenous people to come and talk about what they're experiencing we see more space being made for women and youth we see more space being made for governments from the global south having a bigger voice and being able to demand more from the global north so we, we're getting there slowly the direction of travel is in the right place but that every every one of our organizations can do more to make sure that that moves from paper to practice as soon as possible and just a quick word on mustafa's question in yemen um it may be easy for me to say, uh, say sitting here and from the policy level, but in my limited experience, the, the more local the actor, the more community-based the actor, the less these problems come in specific silos. So an actor working in a community that's being affected by conflict and climate and has short-term needs and long-term needs is likely to see those needs as a package, which will include climate. If we're looking at them from a boardroom here, we're likely to split them out into their different constituent parts. So my sense would be to Mustafa's question, the more you meaningfully hand power to local and community actors, the more you are going to see climate and environment being naturally top of the agenda, because that is what the communities that these actors are embedded in. It's what they're experiencing every day, even if it's not named as such, would be my assumption. Does anyone else want, want to jump in on the Yemen question? Thank you so much. We are running down on time, but we have one final exercise. Um, on all of your tables in front of you, there is a piece of paper with a city name, uh, a major city in Africa, and a QR code, which is linked to a Jamboard, which our host, Charlie, uh, is going to run. Um, essentially, we have a question for each of the four rows of tables. Um, which Charlie has simplified for us, but the first row of tables will be looking at preparedness and response. The second row of tables, knowledge and capacity building. The third row of tables, adapting operational approaches. And the fourth row of tables, advocacy and resource mobilization. So we'd love to get your thoughts and inputs um, flowing into the Jamboard, and that will also help us to frame the final remarks from our speakers. 
And just to work it out, thanks, Nick, and thanks, speakers. Just to say, what we'd really like you to do is have a conversation at your tables. So we don't want you to individually put into the Jamboard. Maybe if one person on the table who's got a laptop can open the Jamboard, and we'd like you to have a conversation. We'd like to try to get some answers to these questions through your collaboration. So feel free to have a chat. If you haven't used Jamboard before, you can see it on the screen. All you need to do is go to the top of the screen and use these arrows that will guide you from page to page until you find your city. And then if you want to add a post-it, you just go to the left-hand side and you click here and you start typing and press return. The question is written on a piece of paper which is in front of you on your table. If the QR code is asking you to download an application, you don't need to do that. I think what's probably better is if someone on the table has got a laptop or a tablet and can just type in the URL code, so the web address that's also on the piece of paper, that's probably the best way to get there. So maybe ignore the QR code and just go for the URL address that's written on the piece of paper. And on a laptop will probably be easier than on a phone. For our online participants, your city is Abidjan. So if you're online, go to the Abidjan page, please. So just a reminder, on your table, try to nominate a note taker and have them go to the Jamboard using the link. When you get to the Jamboard, try to answer the question that is written on the piece of paper on your table. So there'll be a question on the piece of paper on your table. That's the question we want you to answer. The name of the city is just the name of your table. Don't worry, you don't have to be working in that city or anywhere else. We just thought we'd name the tables based on great African cities. Okay, folks, we're just gonna wrap up the session now. So if you have more ideas, you can continue using that link afterwards. But for now, let's hear our final comments from our panelists. Thanks, colleagues. Um, I hope you didn't find the exercise too complicated, but um, we hope that you found the session uh, very thought provoking. Um, and hopefully it's it's raised some some new considerations from your side into how some of the, the feedback from the panelists can be can be built into what you do on a on a day to day basis. Um, we're going to wrap up the session now. So we're going to ask each of the, the panelists to provide you with um, one one sentence or a 30 second close, but just something to, to leave you with that you can take away. Thank you. Sophie? Okay, one sentence, I promised. So 2023 was the year that the humanitarian system finally woke up and decided to take notice of climate change. The challenge for all of you in this room is let's make 2024 the year that we collectively figure out how to do that. So let's share all the experience and knowledge in this room, feed it up to those global policy bigwigs, and let's crack this nut in 2024. Amazing. Thank you. Do you come? Thank you. Um, my my request, if I can request this, is for everyone to actually speak and, and interact with um, um, people that you don't usually work with. Um, you know, talk to development partners, talk to banks, talk to the private sector. You know, sometimes they have ideas and solutions that could be wonderful and could be applied for us as well. Thank you. Excellent. Jason? Yeah, again, thank you all for uh, your participation. The I come back to my original question. Let me make it more specific. 
what aspects of the way we work, how we work, who we work with, how much we cost is sustaining the status quo and what aspects of how we work, who we work is really promoting fundamental change. We often get asked, talked about issues of dependency. And I always say, well, I've been 100% dependent on international aid since I was 24 years old. I have no other skills. Pretty much what this, it's not much. So the dependency question starts with us. It starts with the governments and the strong men and the elites, right? Before it starts with the people in the village, the women in the village, the communities in the village. So let, let's think about ourselves first and how do we change so we're ready to adapt to the, the this reality. And it's incredibly complicated, a complicating factor on what is already a complex uh, world. Thank you. Thank you so much. Really appreciate your presence here today. Thank you so much for sharing your ideas with the with the audience.